Hi, it's early afternoon. It's a good time for a banger in the mouth. Nice. Cold open. Love it. Hello friends and welcome to another video. This week, we're gonna be eating at every Gordon Ramsay restaurant on the Vegas Strip. One idiot sandwich to go, please. Thanks to Shopify for sponsoring a portion of this video. Gordon Ramsay, the man, the myth, the absolute foul mouth legend. I'm sure most of you guys know him at the very least as that one really angry celebrity chef. What are you? An idiot sandwich. And it's true that Gordon Ramsay has made a name for himself, not just with his food, his Michelin stars, or with his many restaurants around the world, but with the numerous TV shows that he's produced and starred in, where he famously screams, berates, and yells bloody murder at stubborn restaurant owners and hopeful executive chefs who have potentially misplaced the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? Come on, lamb Where's sauce? the lamb Where's sauce? The lamb sauce? And as some of you guys may know, Tyler and I are pretty big fans of the Food Network. And to caveat, because most of Gordon's shows aren't on the Food Network specifically, celebrity chefs, food competition shows, and as we always say, any show where Gordon Ramsay yells at people. Listen, 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 listen. Get out! Not only do I enjoy getting to watch really good food getting cooked, I also love a good kitchen cleanout, restaurant makeover, and some interpersonal drama thrown in. Meeting you two for the first time, you are both fing nuts. <laughs> I know. So, a little while ago, while we were doing a kind of crazy thing and speedrunning staying at every single hotel on the Las Vegas Strip, we also took on another kind of monumental task and attempted to eat at every celebrity chef restaurant on the Strip. Because, in sort of the same way that different famous performers have Vegas residencies, a lot of high profile celebrity chefs have their own signature Vegas restaurants. But unfortunately, in that video, we had to limit ourselves to one restaurant per chef to make it even remotely doable. So some stones were left unturned, specifically with our friend Mr. Ramsey. Putting the sin in cuisine. What? As he actually had the most restaurants on the Vegas Strip of any chef on our list. And jokingly in that video, I said that going to all of his restaurants was probably a video in and of itself. So here we are, ready to finally tackle every Gordon Ramsay restaurant on the Strip to get a little taste of what he's serving up, give you the honest scoop about each and every one, and let you know who is the Ramsayest of them all. All right, let's go. Okay. So some background. Gordon Ramsay got his culinary start under the tutelage of the legendary Marco Pierre White, aka Olive Oil Guy. Little olive oil. Little olive oil. And after a lot of training and at least one stint on a boat, Gordon ended up as the head chef of the high-profile French restaurant Aubergine in London in the 90s, where he was already known as a really good chef, but kind of crazy. And when he left Aubergine after a dispute with the owners in 1998, Channel 4 in Britain chronicled his journey of opening his own restaurant with the series Boiling Point, which was the first time he was exposed to a large TV audience. Once again, they swallow their pride and prepare to get Ramsayed. Henry, can you shut the f up? Where he also left the impression of really good chef, but kind of crazy. I don't give a f do you understand? Go you. Why aren't you wiping the plates? Why aren't you wiping the plates? After the success of his restaurant and the eventual winning of a third Michelin star, he was able to rapidly expand his restaurant empire, opening restaurants in the UK, Tokyo, Dubai, and New York. And he was also able to rapidly expand his media presence with UK TV shows like Kitchen Night Nightmares and Hell's Kitchen, which then launched US versions soon afterwards. The hell is that? It's like a fing flip flop. I sort of credit Gordon's initial success as a media personality in the States to the mean Brit phenomenon in US TV in the mid aughts. For some reason, we just really loved seeing British people yell at us. What are you waiting for? A fing hot chocolate? Off. And don't get me wrong, Gordon Ramsay is really mean. He does seem to relish a good curse out. When you just politely tell someone to go and f themselves, it feels really therapeutic. And he does love a good biting insult. That's a wedding suit. That's to get him in the mood to get married. Jesus, I'd rather get f divorced. Oh my God. But I think part of the reason that Gordon's been able to maintain his popularity for so many years is because it does seem like he screams because he cares. Like underneath all those insults, he really wants to see you succeed, to learn to become a better chef. Frank is absolutely delicious. Yeah! Or to turn your business around. You are a talented man. You've just forgotten how talented you are. Unless you've undercooked something, in which case, get the f out. It's fing raw! It's still walking, look at it! Get the f 
cow. And in recent years, he's also established a really prolific digital presence. How long were these wings cooked for? Uh oh, I knew that this was gonna happen. On YouTube and on TikTok. So you too could potentially get berated by Ramsey for your poor culinary skills if you post something vile enough. Oh, hold on. Now you look like you're frying a freaking diaper. All in all, over the last 25 years, Gordon starred in over 20 different TV shows and currently operates over 75 restaurants around the world, with six of them being right here on the Vegas Strip. Hell yeah, putting this in a cuisine. I get it now. And the first one we're gonna be visiting is his iconic Hell's Kitchen restaurant restaurant at Caesars Palace, which is actually the fifth restaurant he opened on the Strip in 2018. We're back, baby. Try to get rid of us? Can't. Came right back. Now, this restaurant is actually in its own freestanding structure next to the front entrance of Caesars Palace. There he is. Send me to hell, Gordon. And inside, it's meant to be a replica of the set where they film Gordon's Hell's Kitchen show, which is a cook-off elimination show where chefs compete to become the head chef of a restaurant. This is how I want Hell's Kitchen to run every single night. Can you do that? Yes, yes, sir! So it's perfectly set up for fan service, and also serves up a hearty dose of some of Gordon's signature Hell branding, with flames everywhere, pitchforks on the ceiling. We're right under the pitchforks this time. Ready to be skewered. <laughs> and many TVs playing clips from Hell's Kitchen on repeat. I love the just non-stop Gordon Ramsay content. And the cuisine seems to be kind of general fine dining with a few signature Gordon dishes thrown in. All right, so the same as last time, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, kind of. Now, we did hit up Hell's Kitchen in our first Celebrity Chef video, but I figured we needed to make sure it was in this video, and we could also see if they've changed anything in the year and a half since we went last time. This is the control. This is the control restaurant. We started off our meal with the Notes from Gordon drink, which comes with a little barb, supposedly from the man himself. Starting off our Vegas trip with an insult. <laughs> the drink was not bad, kind of on the citrusy side. It's pretty good. It's kind of like a but I thought the insult was a little tame. Your chicken is so rubbery, Goodyear called and asked for the recipe. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> Gordon, I don't have any chicken. <laughs> it's your chicken. We're the only chicken here. It's yours. I was just looking to be berated a little bit more. Hey, listen to me, I face. Come here, I said. And interestingly, Gordon may have played himself, as we did get a side of chicken with our beet salad. Is this the rubbery chicken, Gordon? <laughs> it's yours. Uh, this is your chicken. Which wasn't rubbery necessarily, but was very plain, cold, and unincorporated. So this was the only chicken on the table being judged. Besides that, the beet salad itself was better than the chicken, as it was accompanied by some goat cheese and a little stash of pistachios. Did I lose my nut? <laughs> oh, literally, yeah. <laughs> And though the flavor was very beet forward, it was also very fresh and wet tasting. I tried to take a few like selfie bite, and I ended up smelling this. <laughs> As for what else we ordered, we did get a few new items, like the butternut squash soup, which had a vaguely curryish flavor, and also a secret treasure trove of apples in the middle, as well as the baked macaroni and cheese, which was very gouda-y and good. We did, however, once again, order the pan-seared scallops. Noticeably absent, peas. Last time we got this dish, it came with a lot of peas and pea puree, but they were thankfully gone this time around. It's a lot better. <laughs> it's not bitter anymore. It's kind of smoky and rich. And the peas were replaced with bacon and what seemed like a potato puree. Like a restaurant saved by Gordon, this dish was saved by Gordon. Very improved. Yeah. And then we did, of course, have to get the beef Wellington again, which is Gordon's absolute signature dish. My version is a lot lighter and sexier. Look Look at it. I'm ready to die and go to heaven. This is a traditional British dish made with a fillet steak, covered in a mushroom paste, and then wrapped in puff pastry and baked. It's even better the second time around. This may not be everyone's kind of dish, but I do think that Gordon's version is a really good version of a Wellington. Once again, it's the mushrooms that's my favorite part. Oh yeah. Thankfully, Tyler is a big meat pie type of guy, so he loves it. Steak, pastry, and all. There's two luscious butt cheeks. <laughs> Or is it one butt cheek cut in half? Either way is great. <laughs> and we figured that since Gordon serves the Beef Wellington at many of his restaurants, with some variations in price, we should try one everywhere he serves it and see what the differences are. So this is the Wellington test. I am just a vessel through which the Wellington passes. <laughs> you are though. <laughs> we'll see how long the love affair lasts.
And then we did also get a sticky toffee pudding, which is also one of Gordon's signature dishes. It's just so damn good. Wow. Still got it? Got it. Apparently, this recipe is based on his mom's recipe, and it's warm and moist with a sweet butterscotch flavor and paired with some cold ice cream. It's everything and everywhere all at once. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Literally, it is. <laughs> this time, they used speculoos ice cream, which has a bit of a gingerbread flavor. You're going too fast. What? You're going too fast in the bites. <laughs> You're an STP hog right now. Sorry, what? And even though I don't usually like super sweet desserts, I think this one is a real showstopper. All right, I have a surprise for you. I have my own spoon. Yes, spoon. <laughs> okay. Back off. <laughs> now, Gordon also offers the sticky toffee pudding in a few different formats across his different restaurants, so we are also going to test those out as we go along to see what is the best delivery method for the STP. So this is the sticky toffee pudding test. This is an investigative channel, people. <laughs> this is science. This is journalism. <laughs> Now, all in all, I would say Hell's Kitchen is a very solid restaurant. I wouldn't say the food was mind-blowing, but it was very good across the board. So I think it would leave any Gordon fan satisfied and smiling, especially if you picked up a sticky toffee pudding or one of Gordon's signature chef jackets. <laughs> okay, so Gordon actually has a lot of really great merch at his different restaurants, but after looking online to see if I could get some of the stuff after the fact, I think that was kind of cute, actually. I don't think he has an official merch storefront, which I'm kind of disappointed by. It seems like Gordon could use some help from our sponsor of this video, Shopify. Now, if you don't know, Shopify is a commerce platform that lets you super easily build and run your own online store. I'm sure you guys have at least interacted with a Shopify site before, as Shopify hosts millions of online stores across 170 different countries. And since Gordon doesn't have one, I'll show you mine. Yes, our merch site, Fiendish Behavior, is of course hosted by Shopify which you can check out if you'd like. And regardless of whether you have experience or are completely new to starting your own business, Shopify is really easy and intuitive to use. With a drag and drop store editor, a back office that lets you oversee all of your sales and operations, and it also seamlessly integrates with all major social media platforms, allowing you to sell your products on YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, and more. Shopify also allows you to easily expand your online shop into the real world, offering POS systems for brick and mortar stores and pop-up events, and they also also offer a new Shopify Magic AI tool that has a whole suite of features that can help you write better product descriptions and elevate email effectiveness. So if you've always dreamed of opening your own small business, take this as your sign to make the plunge and get your free trial today by scanning the QR code on screen or by going to shopify.com slash Sophia. And as for Gordon, he's missing out, man, because I feel like there's a fair amount of demand for shirts like this one. Got it. <laughs> Target acquired. All right, so the next restaurant on our list was Gordon Ramsay Fish and Chips over at the Link Promenade. <laughs> Eject the fish and chips right out of us. <laughs> now, this is the fourth restaurant that Gordon opened on the Strip back in 2016. I don't think fish and chips were ever a particular signature of Gordon's, but he is British, and fish and chips are a quintessential British dish. British food is so bad. Cheeky fucker. So this is a total branding play, and that plays into the decor and ambiance of the place entirely, as the entire place is red, white, and blue, with Union Jacks everywhere, and the front door is styled as one of those classic British phone booths. It's meant to be a kind of grab-and-go place, but there is some limited seating inside, as well as sort of bar-style seating on the outdoor patio. And we were able to grab one single seat. So we're going to take turns. Filming spot, eating spot. <laughs> now, just to be upfront with you guys, neither Tyler nor I had ever had fish and chips before. Dallas is some lemon. You want, you want some lemon too, right? We're going. Yeah, you can put lemon on the whole thing. Lemon all over the place. You can put lemon on all of it. So apologies if we don't follow appropriate fish and chips protocol here. Shall you I just grab like a, a? I was gonna say a thigh, but that's not what fish have. A battered thigh. <laughs> we started off with a classic box, which is three pieces of fried cod, and honestly, this was super good. I feel like I might have been missing out on something. Like yeah? It's so tender and soft and crunchy and flaky. I kind of like it. It had enough structure that it didn't immediately fall apart, but it did kind of melt in your mouth. That's very good. Yeah. That's just fried substance. Yeah. I was going to say it's almost like a mozzarella stick. <laughs> it is kind of like a very large, hunky mozzarella stick. And the batter was nice and airy as well. Kind of like cod tempura. It's interesting how it just like falls apart. Yeah. There's very little chewing involved at all. 
You slide down the gullet. The slides being the operative word. We did also get a box with three battered bangers. Hi, it's early afternoon. It's a good time for a banger in the mouth. Nice. AKA British sausages. Would you call it a sausage party? Maybe, maybe not, never mind. When it comes to me and Gordon, it's always a sausage party. <laughs> which were also pretty good and vaguely spiced. It's definitely a pretty flavorful banger. Yeah. But since the batter on them was a little thicker, they weren't quite as light tasting as the fish. I did also try out a crispy shrimp, which I liked a lot, but maybe because it was an ideal vehicle for the sauce. And the curry sauce is just... Kiss. Chef Ramsay's kiss. We did try out our fish with some malt vinegar, which is, I think, the traditional sauce for fish and chips. And it was tasty, but we really liked Gordon's tangy sriracha aioli, and especially the cumin -y curry sauce the best. The fries are basically just a curry sauce delivery devices. Now, we really enjoyed Gordon's fish and chips, and we would definitely come back here for the fish specifically. Oh, it's gone. A couple months from tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, who? And it did seem to be a really popular spot. There's also a rotating cast of characters moving behind you. Yeah. Gordon's Fish and Chips is busy right now. Yeah. There is a chance that these fish and chips are kind of Americanized. And I think for the Vegas Strip, the prices were kind of par for the course, as everything is always more expensive on the Strip. But I think in England, it's supposed to be a cheaper dish. So you're paying for novelty, name, and location. Now, the only thing that we forgot to mention was that they do have a sticky toffee item here, the sticky toffee shake to be exact. All right, so they are cleaning the sticky toffee shake machine right now. So it's gonna be about an hour before they're ready to give us our sticky toffee shake. Yes. So we're gonna come back. And once we finally got our hands on it, fish and chips was popping off. So we had to head somewhere else for our taste test. All right, so we hightailed it to the Flamingo Garden. Actually pretty close to our brick. We have some room. We're surrounded by birds. I love it. And I would say, like a flamingo in heat, this thing was super aggressive. I think I just passed away. <laughs> as it contained all of the flavor of the sticky toffee pudding, but almost like in a distilled liquid form. So it's like all toffee caramel butterscotch flavor and none of the cake to ground it. It's literally like have a face full of this. I found it to be both pleasurable, but overwhelming. It's untethered, it's unrestrained. Tyler, on the other hand, chugged it. It's literally all over your face. Leave me some, you fiend. Oh uh, yeah, go <laughs> but we'll do our definitive sticky toffee ranking at the end of the video. Our brick is over there. Oh my God, literally, why are you inhaling it? So the next restaurant on our list was Gordon Ramsay Burger, located right at the main entrance of the Planet Hollywood. And heads up, there are no reservations at this restaurant and it almost always has a pretty significant line. Okay, we thought coming in an off hour would increase our chances of a short line. It is crazy right now. It has not increased our chances of a short line. It is crazy right now, yeah. Gordon Ramsay Burger. So while we're waiting in line, let me tell you about it. This is the third restaurant that Gordon opened on the Strip back in 2012. Apparently it was originally called Burger Burger for Gordon Ramsay, but he quickly abandoned that idea. And though I wouldn't say burgers are a staple of Gordon's signature cuisine, if anything, they're kind of American coded. He does seem to be known for at least critiquing them. Bloody hell, I mean, that's what I call a burger. Yeah, I'd give that nine out of 10. Maybe he just really likes burgers. That line went way faster than I thought it was. Efficient line. Yeah, I thought we were going to be there for like 45 minutes. We were there for like 15 minutes. And the restaurant itself has an interesting ambiance. There's a giant flame installation on one side, and the other side is just straight open to the casino, like there isn't a wall. And there's an ominous Gordon portrait looming in the corner. Now, as an intended appetizer, we got the Bloody Mary dog. Oh my God. <laughs> That's like eight times larger than I was expecting. Costco hot dog ooh. Yeah, just worse the Costco. <laughs> To be fair, the Costco hot dog is $1.50, but this thing was still way bigger than we thought it was gonna be. <laughs> that feels a little inappropriate. <laughs> and interestingly for a high-end dog, they did not try and hide that classic hot dog taste. The hell of a wiener. <laughs> That's a hell of a wiener. As it really led with a nice grilled wiener flavor. And the relish and crispy onions complemented but did not overpower. Nearly impossible to eat, but the sausage tastes pretty good. So against all odds, we decided we really like this thing. It's one of the things where it's a orient and stuff. Right. You get the full bite. You guys Swivel. Get position and you got to stuff everything in around. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my word. So we got a burger each, which were both visually intimidating. So if you're worried that the burger was going to be really large as the hot dog was. It is. <laughs> 
Tyler got the 24-hour burger, which was packed with meat. All right, we've entered the danger zone. The toothpick is out. Oh my God, flatten it. Oh my God, the juices. As there was beef, braised short rib, and brown sugar bacon on it. A lot of meat. <laughs> A lot of flavorful, savory, salted meat. There were some pickled onions in there that occasionally shone through, but it wasn't quite enough to take down the meat extravaganza. Sure, with a veggie. I see them on there. I can't feel them on my mouth, though. <laughs> I got the Hell's Kitchen burger, which I did order because it seemed themed around Gordon himself. Before I show you, I will admit, I'm a sociopath. I like my burgers well done, okay? But I ended up liking it on its own merits. I like the copious amounts of avocado. It had some Southwestern flavors with jalapenos, avocado, some crema type of thingy, and I would call that tomato fire roasted. It is already fire but the flavor is awesome. It was definitely my kind of burger. Bobby Flay, Gordon's best friend. There was also another sticky toffee item here as well, the sticky toffee ice cream sandwich. And at first I was a little panicked because it looked really sticky. It's so shiny. But we quickly figured out that the cookie part of the ice cream sandwich was soft cakey pudding and not even firm enough to be picked up. Oh, 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 I'm having a visceral reaction here. But that aside, I thought this was very good. Amazing. The sticky toffee flavors did have that show-stopping butterscotch impact, but they were kind of tempered by the cold brown butter ice cream. The ice cream ratio is potentially better. I like this one a lot. Overall, I thought Gordon Ramsay burger was pretty fun. It does seem like he's kind of doing the most with the items, so he's throwing a lot of flavors at you, but there were some standout dishes. And apparently they're opening another Gordon Ramsay burger at the Flamingo this summer. So hopefully that can siphon away some of the line. Sorry, I mean, so our next stop on our list was Ramsey's Kitchen at Harrah's. Ramsey's Kitchen is actually Gordon's most recent opening on the Strip, as he opened it in late 2022. And I kind of like the implication here that this is Ramsey's Kitchen, not in hell. It's not hell's kitchen. It's a kitchen. <laughs> Much more inviting tone. <laughs> it's kind of hidden away inside of Harrah's, near the casino floor, but in a corner so you kind of stumble upon it. We came upon it so suddenly. Yeah. It's tucked way back here. An intimate setting in which to enjoy your Wellington. And it's kind of an unexpected gem. Like from the outside, it looks nice, but all that's visible is the bar. But then as you enter, the restaurant is way bigger than it looks. Like there are multiple large, cozy, brass laden dining rooms, and it's kind of beautiful. It's kind of like a very elegant cheesecake factory. Right? Yes. <laughs> It's a bit more art deco and refined than the Cheesecake Factory, but there is a lot of bronze. We're sitting underneath a coaster art piece of Gordon. Yes. He is looming, but from my angle, he looks like circles. Ramsey's Kitchen is supposed to be casually refined dining, inspired by Gordon's travels across the world. I don't really see the international aspect come through that much, but there were some interesting dishes. A little cheese pull action. Cheese pull. Oh, oh, oh. That's a good pull. The flatbread is breaking. Like the blue cheese and roasted grape flatbread. Oh my god, literally, how is this cheese bowl still going? We aren't huge blue cheese heads, but the sourness of the blue cheese was matched pretty well by the juicy grapes, balsamic -y glaze, and some semi-hidden Brussels sprouts. That's very good. It tastes like a bunch of appetizing dishes mashed into one. Yeah. I did also get the tuna tartare, which came with a huge mountain of sour cream and giant wonton chips. Oh, the wonton broke. I'm liking this vision of tartare, dude. Wonton nachos. The wonton chips were kind of precarious to work with, but the flavors were great. Citrusy and just a little spicy. And then, as a heads up, we did get one of the best dishes of our entire trip here, which was the butternut squash risotto. <laughs> An all-dairy pan. What a comforting dish. That was like a hug from Gordon himself. Although I can only imagine those are pretty few and far between, right? What are you, a child contestant on MasterChef? <laughs> <laughs> The risotto itself was nice and fluffy and warm. Oh my god, it's not making fun of me. Very <laughs> 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 And the toasted hazelnuts and sage brown butter kind of put it over the top. The brown butter is nuts. And to add insult to injury, the side of chicken on this is way better than the side of chicken on top of the beet salad at Hell's Kitchen. Now, Ramsey's Kitchen did also offer a beef Wellington, so this is Wellington number two for our Wellington host, Tyler Williams. It did seem to be pretty much the same as the one at Hell's kitchen, but Tyler did enjoy his second go-around. No idea what you're saying, but 
Not sick of it yet. So far, still having a good time. And he also started creating techniques for eating the Wellington more efficiently. You gotta dress your fork, and then you gotta just flop your Wellington on. Any, flop it. Any instinct you have to, to pierce is wrong. No. The only thing is that this one was $10 more expensive for seemingly no reason, which is probably the only negative we had about Ramsay's Kitchen. For dessert, we went for the Eaton Mess, which is a classic British dessert with Chantilly cream, meringue, and berries. Is that, is that asbestos? What are you eating? <laughs> it's the meringue. Okay. <laughs> I think this is usually served as kind of like a parfait or trifle, but Gordon went for sort of a modern presentation here, so we ended up eating it like meringue, chips, and dip. I love the texture of this plant. It's meringue. But we both liked how fresh and light it was. Now, we didn't mean to order the sticky toffee pudding here because it seemed like it was the same as the one at Hell's Kitchen, but they sent one out to us, so we kind of had to partake. And this one ended up coming with creme fraiche ice cream, which was kind of better, as it was kind of a clean canvas for the sticky toffee flavors. It's like drooping. It's good every time. Yeah. We do try and be as incognito as possible when reviewing these restaurants so we can be impartial, but we may have been found out here. But that's not why we liked it, or Ramsay's Kitchen. I know we're not done, but I liked it in there. Yeah. That was a pretty good Gordon Ramsay restaurant, I'm not gonna lie. It's definitely placing the top half of the list. <laughs> Gordon may have literally outdone himself there. <laughs> <laughs> So our next restaurant up was Gordon Ramsay's Pub and Grill at Caesars Palace. This is the second restaurant Gordon opened on the Strip. He actually opened it in the same week as Gordon Ramsay Burger back in 2012, and it's kind of in the main thoroughfare of Caesars, like near the concert hall, restaurants, and slots. There he is. It is a busy evening at Caesars right yes. now. Yes. Something just happened, maybe Adele just let out. Like, everyone's here. And I will say, it had the best selection of Gordon merch I've seen so far. This is where we got those It's Raw shirts. He's missing the right? It's about as good as he could put on a shirt, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More of it. And the restaurant itself is themed to be a full-on British invasion, with red phone booths, London skyline silhouettes, and Buckingham Palace motifs throughout. Gordon is nothing if not committed to the bit. He's kind of going like, yeah, rivalry. The British are coming. <laughs> And we decided to lean into the pub grub vibes with an order of the pigs in a blanket, which were way larger than any pigs in a blanket I've ever seen. He really loves just wrapping meat in pub pastry, doesn't he? You know, some artists like oil paint, some poets like haikus, more than likes wrapping stuff. <laughs> the pastry was nice, and I did like the mustard delivery device aspect, but the bangers were not as flavorful as the ones at Fish and Chips, so they were kind of like soft and mild. And then we leaned into the British theme with an order of the onion onion and ale soup. Not to be confused as French onion soup. No, it's British onion soup. It is covered with Gruyere cheese, which does make for an amazing cheese pull. Hell oh yeah, bro. <laughs> but does also reinforce the idea that this is really close to a French onion soup. The bitter ale, which kind of gives it a deeper, heartier taste, might be the only difference. But regardless, it's very good. A little crunchy cheese. Ooh, nice. I call that finger cheese. That's good cheese. Bonus cheese. Very good cheese. Now, continuing the British grub theme, I ended up getting the chicken tikka masala, which interestingly was invented in Britain in the 1960s by South Asian immigrants. And overall, I thought Gordon's rendition was pretty good. It's very comforting. The chicken, very tender. The rice was fluffy, and the naan was exactly what I wanted. My big complaint, though, was that overall, it was kind of not spicy. Yeah, it's a little like, it's a little tame. It doesn't need to be hot ones level, but I feel like Gordon could definitely turn it up a few notches. Listen. I'm having you. You have to listen to me. Grill does also have a beef Wellington, so it was on to round three for our mate Tyler. It does look a little different. The Wellington came butt down. Butt down. This one was a little different than the previous two. Besides being butt down, it also came with a more hearty mashed potato versus a potato puree. But it also comes with asparagus. Asparagus! And even though beef Wellington is supposed to be a high-end dish, its meat pie vibe does mesh well with the cozy British pub atmosphere. It's all coming together. I'm like, this is where you should be eating this. <laughs> you know, I had a long match with a pitch. Plant. What are you talking about? Oh, God. 
It's also the cheapest Wellington by a couple bucks, so not a bad showing. To round it out, we did get the Guinness Sunday. I thought the guy just brought me a giant beer and I was me like, too. dude, I can't. <laughs> it's sort of got some Bailey's cream at the top and then beer soaked cake and ice cream below. Not bad. And at first I would say that the Guinness actually offset the sweet elements pretty well. Whatever last bite I just had was just beer. Here, come here. <laughs> Go deep. But as you got further down, it was a lot of Guinness. <laughs> Beer. So it ended up being more like you were drinking beer accompanied by a bit of cake. But I think that kind of matches the overall experience. If you're already drunk, you might as well keep going, right? Yeah. Which in general, I really liked. It's cozy, medium casual, warm, with an inviting drunk atmosphere, which seems perfect if you're stumbling out of a convention or an Adele concert. So the final restaurant on our list was Gordon Ramsay's Steak at the Paris. Now this was actually Gordon's first restaurant on the Vegas Strip, sneaking in before Pub and Grill in 2012. And it's right smack dab in the middle of the casino floor in Paris. Now previously, I thought that this tunnel entrance was like a pathway into a steak and that the red thing was kind of like a medium rare steak, but apparently this is supposed to be like the channel leading you from Paris to London, which I guess makes sense. It makes way more sense than like we're tiny like Miss Frizzlesque entering a state. The British are there. <laughs> the restaurant is supposed to be British themed as well, but it's a bit more subtle as the vibe is kind of just like high-end modern steakhouse. We were seated in a booth upstairs, so we were eye level with the crazy red neon chandelier. And apparently this design is actually like a linear representation of the motions Gordon's hands make while wrapping a Wellington, which is actually way more interesting than I thought. It's like when you run in a shape yes. on that one app. It's like your step counter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the cuisine is supposed to be luxury steakhouse with some signature Gordon British fare. I think most celebrity chefs like doing steaks because they're expensive, but Gordon does seem to be a steak enthusiast. And steak's delicious. We got the hamachi crudo to start, which was actually very complex, as Gordon used the fish as almost like a table to put ingredients on top of. All right, let me try just making a really long fork. Oh, that's pretty good. Can I go for the flat bite? So it was actually like a flavor and texture explosion in your mouth with smooth creme fraiche, sweet apple, salty seaweed, and crispy rice. I like the crunch. They always look like rice crisps from a crunch bar. Yeah, they are like rice krispies. That's a, that's a lot happening. And then we did also get a scotch egg, which is a boiled quail egg wrapped in sausage and then fried, which doesn't necessarily sound good. It sounds more like a keto hack. A scotch egg down the hole. But let me tell you, this thing actually rocks, as it's a savory and rich bite with a little runny yolk offset with some pickled cabbage. I need like eight more of Yeah, I'm sad we can get another one. <laughs> Honestly, I really do wish we had ordered more of these. Bartender, can you hit me with another scotch egg? <laughs> <laughs> now we didn't really order just a super high-end plain steak here, both because I bet you it's just good, but we also don't really know how to judge super high-end steaks beyond just saying it's good. So I went for this stuffed chicken breast, which came with a nice hunk of maitake mushrooms and a truffled potato croquette, both of which I really liked. I was hoping it was an elongated scotch egg, but unfortunately no. I thought the chicken breast was pretty good, but I didn't love the truffled thigh mousse stuffing as I thought it was just too rich tasting. So I just went to town on the mushrooms. I like the fungus, the whole fungus, and nothing but the fungus. So help me, Gordon. And then for our final installment of the Wellington test. Oh, wait. See? Where is the Wellington? <laughs> Tyler took on the land and sea Wellington. This is your final boss. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Which is not only the most expensive Wellington on the list, but also easily the most formidable. This is how Gordon gets it, apparently. I mean, he, he, he lives a life of luxury, okay? Man's <laughs> as it comes not only with a lobster tail on top of it, but also multiple giant scallops around it. I do think this is the kind of dish that might give you gout on the spot. It's like the lobster is like infused butter into the fish. <laughs> but it does taste pretty spectacular in a really rich, salty, over-the-top kind of way. I think I like scallops. <laughs> Gordon, wow. This is good. The scallop redemption arc continues. It's real. Now to finish off our Gordon pilgrimage, we got the roasted grape cheesecake for a little change of pace. It looks like a block of cheese, like Tom and Jerry style. The cheesecake itself was pretty good with an herby thyme crust. The cheesecake is so like fun. It just like drifts up on your tongue. But the grapes were a little too soaked for my taste. They're almost 
Gurney. But this thing wasn't bad. It's just no STP. Now, overall, Gordon Ramsay's steak was pretty enjoyable. I'm happy we uncovered the mystery of this tunnel and weird chandelier, and I do think that the land and sea Wellington is a sight to behold. But we do have to note that this place was the most expensive restaurant on our list by far, so it was certainly an expensive trip through the tunnel. Now, in terms of an outro here, we figured the best thing to do would be to list our top threes of our favorites for different categories, before giving you guys our results of our various tests, of course. First up, for best overall experience, our favorites were Ramsey's Kitchen, which was kind of an unexpected gem, but I would actually really recommend it, Fish and Chips, can't speak to the authenticity, but the food is very tasty, and then the original Hell's Kitchen, which does really give you the whole Gordon package. From the set, to the pitchforks, to the Wellington, it's fun. Next up for best dish, our picks were the butternut squash risotto at Ramsey's Kitchen, the scotch egg at Ramsey's Steak, and then we were kind of split between that really crazy Bloody Mary dog from Burger and the classic fish bag basket from Fish and Chips. And then for decor slash ambiance, our picks were once again Ramsey's Kitchen, which is just our favorite restaurant across the board, then Pub and Grill for a nice, warm, casual, down-to-party vibe, and then probably Hell's Kitchen, just because it does have that TV show wow factor. As for which sticky toffee pudding was the best, I don't think any of the alternative forms really beat the classic STP, so for that reason, I would recommend the one at Ramsey's Kitchen, because between the Speculoos and the Creme Fraiche ice cream, the creme fraiche is our a la mode of choice. And as for our Wellington test, they were all very similar except for the last one, but I think we have to give it to Pub and Grill. Not only was it the most affordable Wellington, but from the asparagus to the mashed potatoes to the ambiance, it had Tyler calling soccer football. All in all, I would say we had a great time hitting up all of these restaurants, and though we did eat a lot of Wellington, the guy who invented the Wellington doesn't even like the Wellington this Joe much. Wellington <laughs> doesn't like it this much. I thought that Gordon Gordon actually offered a fair amount of variety, and to his credit, he definitely tries a lot of things, as each restaurant gives a unique experience and definitely leaves its own impression. I mean, the man knows how to decorate a restaurant. As for my advice to him, I would say he could take it easy on the f***ing sprouts. Go skip on the sprouts. Oh my god, not the return of the sprouts. Return of the sprouts. And he could be a little meaner in his little notes. I mean, it's what the people want. Get out! F***ing get out! Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked that video, make sure to shamash that like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to shamash that subscribe button. Here are our short form slash social media handles. There's hair in my mouth. And with that, I will see you guys next time.